Hi, it's Dr. Khan with chapter three, specifically chapter three, section one and two. The learning objectives for this section include sketching and labeling and explaining the rock cycle. And the second learning objective is discussing igneous rocks in ways that we can kind of tell their story through looking at the clues that they have to share with us regarding their crystal size um, and their color. Uh, section one, uh, 3.1 um, is discussing the rock cycle. And it's important to note that we can begin at any point in the rock cycle describing what might happen to a specific rock. But the basic outline of how it happens begins with magma and the crystallization or cooling of the magma, either above ground or below ground, and that forms igneous rock. Rock at the surface is then weathered or broken down turned into sediment and that sediment can be compacted and cemented together in order to create a new rock a sedimentary rock and finally the last process would be putting a lot of pressure and heat on an existing rock so that it changes its structure or composition and that's uh, the formation of a metamorphic rock the next slide shows you Smart Figure 3.1, which is something you can actually click on either in a PowerPoint if you download this PowerPoint from Canvas or I give you the links directly in the Canvas module. I highly recommend looking at the Smart Figure, which does a good job of giving you a walkthrough of the different paths that a rock could potentially take through the rock cycle. But note that, again, it's not just one linear path. There are lots of different things that can happen to interrupt the cycle along the way. 3.2 talks about igneous rocks. We're going to focus a lot on this, and that includes our time in lab during our first class. Um, so make sure that you spend some extra time looking at the different types of igneous rocks, how to classify them, et cetera. And there's some good tools um, that can help you along that, that route. So igneous rocks mean to formed by fire. And one of the main things that it's asking you to do here is looking at the two criteria used to classify igneous rocks. And that's going to be um, number one, the composition, and number two, the texture. The texture is related to the rate of cooling of the magma into solid rock. So magma cools and crystallizes. You should know the difference between lava and magma. Lava does not have the gases that are dissolved in the magma because magma is still underground and lava has extruded or come, has come out of the ground. And that gets us to our first kind of set of terms that are alike. This section actually has quite a few pairs of synonyms um, that you have to know that vocabulary is just used to describe uh, igneous processes. So the first is if magma comes out of the ground, we call that igneous rock, once it hardens, volcanic or extrusive. Extruding means coming out of. Um, and we'll see that there's another pair of those words too, that we have intrusive rocks that cool from magma underground. And those are um, uh, typically rocks that are going to be uh, larger crystals because they have a slower cooling rate. So, we have these ions that are in the magma that are arranged in orderly patterns during their cooling. And so that's, that's what a mineral is, they form minerals. But the crystal size is really determined by how quickly the rock is cooling. So the slower you cool the rock, the larger the crystals are gonna be. So looking at a sample of a rock, if you see large crystals, it's giving you an indication that that rock formed underneath the surface of the earth within the crust, and that would be um, an intrusive type of igneous rock. A fast rate forms very small crystals that are hard to see just with the naked eye. So those would be considered fine-grained rocks, but those microscopic crystals really tell us that the rate of cooling was fast and that the cooling must have happened at or near the surface. If the rock cools very fast such that it doesn't have time to form crystals in a pattern at all, we call that a glass. Obsidian is one example, that type of igneous rock. So igneous compositions, we need to know that the main ingredient uh, that's uh, occurring in magma that forms igneous rocks is 
silica. So that silicate material uh, is either going to, it's going to range somewhere between 50% and 70% of the rock's composition. The rocks that are higher in silica are called granitic or felsic. There's another pair of synonyms that you have to know, granitic or felsic compositions. These are lighter in color and higher in silica. On the other side of the spectrum, we have basaltic or mafic compositions. These are around 50% silica. These are darker type minerals that form from these mafic magmas. And using this, this spectrum of composition and cooling rate, we get our different types or classifications of igneous rocks. So along the type, top here, we have composition, granitic, and acidic, which is an intermediate, basaltic, which is mafic. So here we have a decreasing amount of silica and our ultramafic. So if it's coarse grained, in other words, if we have uh, really magma that's high in silica, that's the felsic or granitic, and it formed underground, giving it large crystals, we have the rock named granite. That's a coarse grained, big crystals. Fine grained, small crystals must mean that it's extrusive, it formed at the surface from lava. If it's made out of this high silica felsic composition, but it cooled really quickly, so it has microscopic crystals, we call that rock rhyolite. That's just a little introduction here. They're going to give you a lot more information, and this I'd really focus on this, especially in light of the labs that we're going to be doing in class together. Please make sure you click on that smart figure 3.4, and it will walk you through this chart and talk a little bit more detail about how we classify and name those igneous rocks. So again, that fine-grained is a fast rate of cooling. All that means is small crystals. Coarse-grained means um, slow rate of cooling. It's those larger crystals. These types of terms are talking about an igneous rock's texture. Porphyritic means two crystal sizes. So we'll see large crystals and a matrix of smaller crystals. And that actually tells a more complex story of a rock that started forming underground intrusively, forming those big crystals, but then was extruded out before cooling had com been completed. In other words, the rest of the liquid magma cooled or crystallized at or above the surface. So this um, porphyritic texture indicates that cooling happened both inside and outside of the Earth's crust. Glassy, again, like obsidian, very fast rate of cooling. The texture indicates that it didn't have time to create those crystals. Vesicular, this is like a frothy lava that had a lot of gas in it and the rock hardened with those gas bubbles intact. So we have, very, we have a rock with a very low density from that frothy material. And finally, a pyroclastic texture. These are a bunch of fragments that are welded together um, as they're being shot out of a volcano, essentially. So we'll see lots of fragments that, are, um, that look like they're kind of welded or cemented together. Another important smart figure here. So please click on that igneous rock textures, which will go into more detail and give you some examples of names of rocks uh, that define or help you define these different textures. So common igneous rocks include granite, um, this granitic rock. So these are, again, granitic is a synonym with felsic. So we're talking about high silica, light colored minerals. So these felsic uh, rocks are composed of these lighter colors. Quartz and feldspar are the minerals that dominate these types of rocks. And common examples are granite, which is intrusive, forming inside of the Earth's crust, large crystals, rhyolite, cooled at the surface very quickly, and microscopic crystals, but also same composition. So high in silica, quartz and feldspar. And then obsidian, which is a glass, this one really doesn't fit the lighter color model because it does cool so quickly. Obsidian, if you've heard of that before, it's like a black glass. So this would be the exception when we're looking at a rock and making a judgment about its composition, which we can tell by color, obsidian is going to be the outlier here. And acidic is an intermediate rock, so it has somewhere around 60% um, silica minerals. 
It's a mixture of felsic and mafic compositions, andesite and diorite being two examples, andesite being the extrusive and diorite being intrusive. And finally, the basaltic rock, this is mafic in composition, so it's our dark colored minerals, minerals with about 50% less of, um, of silica in them. The basalt is the extrusive version of this, so microscopic crystals, cooled quickly, volcanic, and gabbro would be the intrusive, larger crystals, slow cooling rate, a version of basaltic rocks. And again, a little more detail with this chart. This chart you can actually find in your book and it's incredibly helpful, but I definitely recommend clicking on the smart figure to help place what these rocks look like. We're going to be working with samples of these rocks during class, so it's important um, that these examples become familiar to you. Igneous rocks form uh, as magma's cooling or as lava's cooling, but uh, Bowen came up with this it's called a reaction series that shows the order in which minerals crystallize as temperatures cool uh, and magma is forming into rock. Bowen's reaction series talks about as we have a cooling temperature. So starting out here with high temperatures, cooling down here. What happens? What, what minerals will crystallize out of the magma? So one thing that stands out to me in this image is that our very mafic ultramafic and mafic types of minerals are crystallizing out or, or turning into solid from this liquid. They're crystallizing out first, so they can crystallize out even at a high temperature. And it's not until we lower the temperature down to this lower temperature range here, a little cooler than 750 degrees, we start crystallizing out our most felsic of materials. Where we can again think about a magma chamber that contains this liquid or molten magma. And as that magma chamber is cooling over time, we'll start settling out those mafic crystals that will form at the bottom. And over time, more mafic uh, minerals like the pyroxenes will start accumulating at the bottom of the magma chamber. What this does is it essentially removes some of the most mafic components of the magma. So if we have not cooled all the way and a volcanic eruption happens, what's left in that chamber is very felsic minerals. Everything else will be solid. The only things that will be left as molten magma is going to be your felsic materials here. So Bones Reaction Series helps explain how we can get different types of magma. How do we get rhyolitic magma, which is very felsic in nature? Well, it's because we've separated out those mafic components. Maybe because that magma chamber had cooled over time, not all the way, but had settled out all of those very mafic components, leaving a very felsic uh, lava. So it's one, one possibility of why we might have uh, a rhyolite. Bowen's reaction series is discussed in more detail in your book. Um, but there are also some activities, I'll flip back there for a second, there are also some activities on Pearson that will help give you a little more visualization of how that magma chamber would look as different minerals are settling out 